Hello everyone and welcome into the Friday Walkthrough. I'm Cole Carmody alongside Monty Spiller. Kansas State takes care of business against Baylor 59 to 25 and now the Sunflower Showdown is up next. We're going to talk about both of those games but before we do we want to let you know we're sponsored by Booth Creek Wagyu. Remember to elevate your tailgate this season with our friends from Booth Creek Wagyu. Their ranch is located just north of Manhattan and proudly raises authentic Wagyu beef from farm to table. Visit their retail locations in Manhattan and Overland Park or online at boothcreekwagyu.com. Well, Monte K-State took care of business. It was not always pretty for K-State, but there was a lot of good things that happened for the Wildcats. Yeah, going into this game, um, I-, I was confident about uh, the Cats. Baylor, they're not good, you know, but you never know. In, in Big 12 football, some teams show up and they're surprised and they compete. But um, Baylor-, Baylor historically has been a, a well-coached team. But they haven't played well this year in K-State. We needed a win to bounce back and come ready to roll, and we did. So, yeah, K-State looked good most of the time. And even when we didn't look good, yeah. Baylor put us in a position to look better than what we did. So, yeah. It was it was interesting to listen to Dave Aranda's comments after the game because he talked with the media, and he said this is the lowest that they've ever been. This yeah. was rock bottom. He spent, Monty, he spent two minutes talking about a six-yard trap play and how he knew because the linebacker didn't try and make the tackle and just ate the block that his team was going to be in trouble. It's amazing how coaches can see little things like that and know that their team is doomed Baylor, after they scored that touchdown on their uh, first possession to tie the game, it really was downhill from there. Yeah, even when they scored the touchdown, I felt like the celebration was a a false or a fake (laughs) celebration, you know, trying to get that fake momentum, that fake hype. Because Baylor still knew they were they were out man they were they were the lesser team and, and kind of coach you know as a head coach you see it during practice all week and game time when you're warming up you know when a team is ready to play the energy and it wasn't just Baylor didn't have it and they knew they were the the lesser team in case State was a better team on the road it's tough to beat a good team and they kind of quit they did and when K State scored 35 points in the first half it yeah. was it was it's hard to win anytime you give up 35 points in general it's hard to win but when you give up 35 points in the first half it is really hard to win. Win. I think the story of this game, without question, though, Will Howard becoming the all-time passing touchdowns leader in Kansas State history. He threw for three. His final line was 19 for 29, 235 yards and three touchdowns. Marty, most of that damage came in the first half, and what a special moment it was for Will. Yeah, I'm glad K-State and, and K-State Athletics was aware that he was so close to the record and allow him to play enough to get the record, and I'm glad that we did it at home mm-hmm. and we did it in a, in a game that means something because obviously we're still in the Big 12 race to get to, back to uh, Dallas for the Big 12 championship, but to win in that fashion in a dominating way and for Will being the leader that he has been and the ups and downs, you know, mm-hmm. there were times where everybody was calling for his head, Bring in Avery, which Avery is a great player, but I'm so glad that Will uh, kind of solidify his legacy as one of the great quarterbacks in K State history. It, it's so weird to look at Will Howard yeah. because this is a guy you mentioned. He has had so many ups and downs yeah. in his career, and yeah. he talked about that after the game. But you could see the emotion. If you see the videos that K State put out on their social medias, how much that just meant to him, that moment. And he did. He threw the ball to Christian Moore, a guy who hadn't <laughs> scored a touchdown in his career yeah. from California, the fullback. Uh, that was a really cool moment, but. Again, the offense was absolutely rolling on Saturday. Once again, K State scored over forty nine or forty points at home. They've scored over forty points in, at home in every single game this season. They're undefeated at home. There is just something about Bill Snyder Family Stadium. Yeah, you're right. When you come home, it's hard to beat the Cats. I know me as a former player, we took pride in it. We had a saying, we don't lose at home. You know, we didn't call it the Bill at the time because Coach Snyder was our coach. <laughs> but we, we didn't lose at home, and these guys have the same pride. And it's one of those things where, as I was watching that Baylor game, I kept thinking about the losses we had this year. But every loss we had, we were still in the game. Mm-hmm. And even when we played bad, we were still – like a play away from tying the game up or winning the game. And, and that gives me hope. And it's one of those things, when this team is on, we're on. And looking forward to the next game against KU and then Iowa State, I like our chances, but that was a solid quality win against a Big 12 opponent, albeit Baylor's down this year. But they took care of business because it's easy to play down to a team's level. In case they didn't let that happen, and special teams is playing better, and so is defense. But it was a good team victory. It was awesome to watch. And I want to talk about the secondary, your spot of the field, right. Keaton Garber with the pick six. As a former D-back, right. A, have you ever had that experience of knowing you're about to break on the ball and score a touchdown? And B, what did you see from Keenan on that play? I, I've had experience of breaking on the ball, not quite having uh, the, the clear field pick six. 
I it was a great break and it was towards the sideline. So just making the making the interception and keeping the ball. But when I saw him, it reminded me of a few years back when DJ Reed broke against mm-hmm. Patrick Mahomes mm-hmm. when Texas Tech was at home. Good call. Same side of the field. Yep. Uh, same end, and the crowd was going crazy, and he broke on it, didn't break stride, and it was, it was just beautiful. I immediately thought about that play mm-hmm. uh, when DJ had that pick. But Garber, he showed his speed. Yeah. He showed his speed. He opened up and pulled away, and that was a thing of beauty. It was cool to watch because that's a guy, another guy who has a great story in Keenan Garber. This is a guy who came in as a wide receiver. Yep. That He was viewed as a potential deep threat for Skylar Thompson when he was the quarterback. Yeah. Makes the change over to cornerback. Gets his first career touchdown on defense. That was really cool. Just jumped a hitch route and voila, took it all the way back for six. That was a really cool moment in the game. Another cool moment belongs to another Kansas kid, and that's Cody Stuffelbean and Desmond Purnell. Both Kansas kids. Uh, Cody Stuffelbean gets his first career sack, and on that play, Force fumble. Desmond Purnell picks it up, scores a touchdown. Anytime you get two defense touchdowns in one game, uh, yeah, you're going to win. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love it. Stuff of being. That's, that's a great last name. Yeah. I'm sorry. You know, you got to be a defensive player right. if you got a last name, Stuff of being. I was happy for him to get that opportunity. And we've been talking about Desmond Perrell for, I mean, Purnell, excuse me, for the last three or four weeks. And he has taken over, not saying this wholeheartedly, but he's a leader mm-hmm. on that defense, not just as linebackers. He's all over the place and he's playing a lot more. And I see that Coach Cl- uh, Klanderman has more confidence in him. And the kid just plays hard. And him being a former safety, Moving a linebacker, he plays at a different speed. So good for him. He's having a good time. He looks humble, and I'm excited for him to get these Jayhawks this, this come Saturday. Yeah, let's talk about that linebacker group because all of a sudden now, uh, with the Jake Clifton injury, yeah. Chris Kleiman announced on Tuesday Jake Clifton would be done for the year. We don't know exactly what's wrong. Might find out later in the week. But Jake Clifton out for the season. That is going to mean that Austin Romaine goes back to the starting linebacker position at the mic. Started a few games at Mike already this season. He'll have more of a role. Of a role. Bo Palmer, another former walk-on from Blue Valley High School, will get that opportunity to be that second rotational guy. And Rex Van Wy, a guy we saw at the end who maintained his red shirt, he will now get the opportunity to step in and maybe be that rotational player, maybe play about you know 20% of the snaps. Um, but this linebacker room, is it's amazing how even with three season-ending injuries at that linebacker position, there's still some quality depth there. There is, and you hate to see injury in any situation. Um, but K-State's linebacker room has taken our lumps this year. But like you talked about, the fresh, true freshmen, redshirt freshmen, younger guys have had opportunities early in the season to get playing time. And now, thankfully, they have. They understand the speed of the game. They won't come into the game, eyes wide open, head spinning. They'll fit right in wherever coach may need them to play. And I think a few series in the game – They'll get a feel, and they'll get their rotation, and that group, whoever's in, they'll be okay. I'm not nervous about bringing a guy in. I'm excited for him, Mm -hmm. but I'm not nervous. And Austin Romaine's played well. I mean, this is a guy, you know, when Jake Clifton was starting to come back from injury, they – you know, they, they had Austin Romaine start, and, and he, he played well. I thought that Texas Tech game he played pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, now he's going to have an opportunity to be in his first Sunflower Showdown. We'll talk about that more in the second half. Yeah. Um, but, again, I, I look at this defense. I think they're in a really healthy spot. And one guy I want to shout out, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Cooper Beebe on the defensive side of the ball. got in. He got in on two snaps. He actually made a tackle. So yeah. if you were at the game and you heard Cooper Beebe on the stop, you heard that right. Cooper Beebe got in that nose tackle. Uh, it's pretty cool to see uh, Beebs get in there in place of nose tackle. It is. It's kind of funny because when I saw that happen, normally um, it's a defensive lineman or defense tackle, nose guard, going to the offensive side of the ball on goal line as a fullback. You got mm-hmm. the big body to create a hole. That It was different. They were like, hey, you know what? <laughs> we can do it too. Old linemen, they can be physical. They can be athletic. And Cooper, man, that guy, he's, he's going to have a phenomenal uh, pro career, but he's done everything possible he can, he could uh, at his college career, and to see him on defense as well made my heart happy. It was pretty cool. Yeah, you, yeah. you don't see that too often. Chris Kleiman said after the game that uh, he's not Travis Hunter, but he might be the second best two way player in all right, of college right. football. Overall, just an outstanding day of football for K State. Not going to spend too much time on it because. Quite frankly, if you're watching this show, you want to talk about the Sunflower Showdown and all the other happenings around the Big 12. Before we get into the second half of the show, I want to talk a little bit about the Big 12 in general. And obviously the news that's going on around the conference right now is the tiebreaker situation. Uh, As we record this, the latest update is that really if head-to-head does matter. We didn't know if that was going to be the case, but they say that the head-to-head takes precedent regardless if it's a multi-team tie or not. So, you know, we still have over 16,000. Yes, you heard that right. 16,000 potential outcomes with these two weeks, but there are some interesting games on the docket. So I I want to get your opinion on these games. We'll start 
with Iowa State hosting Texas, a night game. It's going to be going on at the same time as the K-State game, but I'm definitely going to keep my eye on that one because that is going to be a great game. Anybody who knows college football, well, anybody who knows Big 12 football knows late in the season, going into Ames, Iowa, a night game, that crowd is crazy. Probably one of the top three environments at nighttime in the Big 12. Um, and Texas, they know it's cold. A lot of those Texas boys, I'm a Texas boy, mm-hmm. they don't want to go to Ames and play a night game because it's physical. They're going to slow it down a little bit. They're going to do everything they can to upset Texas. So that's one game we will be watching. It helps K-State out if Texas were to lose. Um, but I'm curious to see what happens. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Iowa State won that game. I wouldn't either. I mean, it's just – and Iowa State's playing well right now. They, are, they yeah. knocked off BYU at a night game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, they're playing well right now. It wouldn't shock me to see Iowa State win that game. On the flip side, we just talked about BYU, just mentioned BYU. They host Oklahoma. The spread is 24 and a half. The game's at 11 o'clock Central Time, which means it's at 10 o'clock Mountain Time. Mm-hmm. I, I don't really know how that affects the game. I mean, I think Oklahoma should win this game. But anytime you're going to Provo, that just seems like a it seems like a game where Oklahoma could just kind of try and you know slide through and maybe look ahead to the last week of the season. I think that's actually going to be a sneaky good game. That's that's another game that would scare me. If I'm an OU fan, if I'm an OU player, um, I'm not looking past these guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, BYU, albeit they're not very good, they're kind of like a Baylor. Mm-hmm. They traditionally are good, but this year they've been down. Uh, I'm not sure if it's injury, the transition to the Big 12, or what, but they're not the BYU that I expected to see this year. But when you're at home, I'm thinking it's senior night for a lot of yeah. those guys. They're going to have a lot of emotion. I guarantee each other, each teammate is going to play for my, my seniors. We don't want to go out on a loss for senior night. So look to be, for BYU to do everything different as far as special teams, trick play, um, change a few things up. That environment, I, I've never been there, but from watching on TV, those fans, those students, they get routed just like anybody else. I think OU will win, but it'll be a close game. And this is also a BYU team that's fighting for bowl eligibility. Yeah. Yep. So never discount that. Another team fighting for bowl eligibility that K-State fans will surely be watching is Houston <laughs> and Oklahoma State. Yeah. Dana Holgerson lays an egg last week <laughs> against Cincinnati at home. But you know what? It's just like this Houston team to turn around and beat Oklahoma State, isn't it? I can see that happening. And Houston has enough. Kind of like off air we talked about Central mm-hmm. Florida. And I said um, – don't be surprised if Central Florida beats Oklahoma State. A lot of people thought it was crazy. I said, I'm telling you, Central Florida has speed, and their starting quarterback is back, and they're playing at home, and they're playing confident. Houston, they they kind of they felt what it's like to be in the Big 12. You know, coming over, they weren't used to week in and week out the battles. Now they know. And I remember when they played us, their front D line was athletic, and Oklahoma State's strength is their run game. And I feel like if they can put seven in the box – and force Oklahoma State to throw the ball, they could compete. Yeah. And I feel like Houston offense is good enough to score, and they got some athletes that can make plays on air and, and make you compete. I think it'll be a closer thing. And right now, Oklahoma State, they were what, in a four-game winning streak? Mm-hmm. I can see them tanking a little bit. It's not saying they're going to lay down, but they were riding that high. I don't know. It's I, That's a tough one to pick. 45-3. to three. How do you get back off the mat exactly. in that game? It's it's going to be fascinating it's to watch. Game. I know I'll be following the Big 12. Monty, I know you will as well. But the game that everybody that's watching this show cares about is the Sunflower Showdown. Kansas State goes on the road to take on Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas. We will talk about that game when we come back. Welcome back in here to the Friday Walkthrough. I'm Cole Carmody alongside Monty Spiller. We are sponsored by Booth Creek Wagyu. Make sure if you go to the game on Saturday, not only do they have a store in Manhattan, they also have one in Overland Park. I'm not saying go visit Johnson County. I'm from Johnson County. I will actually be in Johnson County on Saturday before the game. So maybe, you know, I I always say go and get us a burger and grill. Maybe if you just want to, like, give me a gift. There you go. Just go to Overland Park, drop it off at my doorstep. I don't know if I'll give you my address. That might be a little weird, but <laughs> go get you some uh, Booth Creek Wagyu. Let's talk about this game now, Monty. K- Kansas State comes in as the favorite, the twenty-first team in the twenty-first ranked team in the country. Uh, Kansas comes in at seven and three, four and three in the Big Twelve, ranked number twenty-five. This is the first ranked game between these two schools in a very long time. It is, and what a difference a week make. I know last week they were higher ranked than us, and. Uh, a lot of people were excited about the game. And people are still are excited about the game. But I will say uh, I'm glad they're ranked 25th, not higher. Mm-hmm. That's one of those things. But it makes it makes the game a lot more interesting. And, and it's more fun for the whole state of Kansas. I'm not a native Kansan, but I've been living here for a while. So I take a lot of pride in it also. And it's one of those games where if you can either in Manhattan or Lawrence 
You have both teams with good players, nationally known players, uh, and their storylines on both sides. It's exciting for the state of Kansas. Before we get going with this preview, I got to ask you, since we're talking about this game, what is your favorite memory as a player from this series? Man, uh, we had so many. Goodness, I'm probably one of the best games that I I didn't even play in was my redshirt freshman year, and uh, we were, we were going, and I I wasn't nervous because I knew I wasn't playing. <laughs> I was it was redshirt. It's one of those games where um, Chad May was a quarterback and. And he was a name, but not a big name at the time. And Kevin Locke was one of the receivers. And a couple Mitch running and got J.J. Smith, all those guys that were older than me. And it's prepping them for practice that week. And I remember they were hyping. We were actually decent. And I remember Jamie Mendez talking about, you know, hey, young guys, give our, our older guys a look. And we took pride in it. And I remember uh, picking off Chad May and practicing as a redshirt freshman. And he was throwing the ball to Tyson Swig, and I broke on it. And uh, Chad, we, we love him to death. And he was cocky. He would talk a lot of Mac. Mess, but defense we call him Fat Five because he went number five. We just mess with him to get him angry. But I remember he got so mad. He said, "Run it back!" And he ran the same play several times until so they got it right. But they were ready. And as a player, pepping those guys, and we dominated that game. That was fun. But as a player, uh, a lot of times, no matter if you were first team, second team guy, you knew you were gonna play mm-hmm. because K State known they got up early against them. And guys at halftime, they were like, "You second team guys, get ready to play." So mm-hmm. we got excited. But uh, a lot of good memories for me. A lot of good memories for me. It'll be interesting to see if that same thing happens on <laughs> Saturday. Um, if there is one silver lining, if you're Kansas coming into this game, uh, Lance Leipold has talked extensively about Jason Bean in his media sessions. Mm. Um, there are some uh, some sayings that he may or may not play in this game. Suffered a head injury on Saturday. We don't really know how bad it is. Uh, as of Wednesday night, he told uh, reporters on his radio show that yeah, there might be a chance he plays. So we'll see what happens. If not, they're going to go with Cole Ballard. That's Chris Ballard's son, the general manager of the Indianapolis Colts. Um, he is a true freshman from Indiana. That is their third string quarterback. Jalen Daniels, unless a miracle happens, we don't anticipate seeing him um, even suiting out on Saturday. But nonetheless, the quarterback position is going to be massive. I, I really believe that this game can be flipped if Jason Bean plays quarterback. There is an element for Kansas that they wouldn't have with the true freshman walk-on quarterback. I agree. Uh, Being he's a dynamic player, first of all, you know, I hate to see any player Mm -hmm. uh, get injured, especially when it's ahead, and I pray that he's okay. Uh, If he plays, great. If he doesn't, moving forward, I want to see the young man be okay, no matter who who he plays for. But he's a dynamic individual. He throws the ball well, but he's even more scary with his legs. Mm -hmm. And like you said, if he plays – K-State has to account for broken plays. They have to account for the RPO. They have to account for him keeping plays, extending plays, because he's done a really good job of getting out of the pocket and keeping his eyes downfield uh, a lot more than he has in the past. So he's a really dynamic player. And he reminds me, not as a player, but kind of a story, a lot of will. You Mm -hmm. know, he didn't come in as one of the top guys. He kind of been loved. He been hated. Uh, you know, when Daniels came in, the, the fans called for Daniels to come in and, and sit being, and he didn't transfer. He could have either transferred. He stuck it out. He stayed true to his program. And then when injury happened to Daniels earlier, he stepped in and got KU on the roll. So I, I would love to see him uh, finish off his season on a high note. But if he doesn't play against us, I get it. But he does scare me. Now, with the freshman Ballard, I'm not as scared. Mm-hmm. He does not as mobile. But you give him a week of practicing with the ones, not saying he's going to be great, but he has a little more of a playbook. And Lipo and his offense staff does one of the best jobs in the country of using our tight ends, pre-snap motion, pre-snap adjustments. It's tough to see. Well, that was what I was going to next. Uh, how do you adjust to all this motion? Because, <laughs> I mean, at on the when you're at home and um, your crowd is super loud, I feel like it's a lot harder to do those pre-snap motions and shifts. But when you are at home – and it's easier to do that because the crowd is quiet when you're on offense. Yeah. That's when KU starts to really get exotic. Now, with that being said, it's also easier for the defense to communicate. But I feel like there is definitely an element of surprise there with all these different shifts in motion that KU runs pre-snap. It is. And, and it's not necessarily the pre-snap that gets defenses. It's once they get set, all it takes is one guy to be bad with their eyes and somebody's running open, wide open. I've seen it happen time after time. Mm-hmm. And they do a really good job with hiding their ace back and their two tight ends. They do a really good job with Fairchild, and they do a, a really good job also um, I should, uh, the kid from Plainville. I should know his name. Jared Casey. Jared Casey. Yep. My, my, uh, my, my family are going to give me a hard time because they got a bunch <laughs> of Plainville. Uh, Jared Casey. They do a good job of hiding those two. And then once you target Fairchild, Casey's running wide open and vice versa. But they do a good job with that. So K-State has to communicate, get lined up, and then once you're lined up, 
Be good with your eyes. Don't get caught picking in the backfield because if you do, somebody's running past you. And you miss, You mentioned Mason Fairchild at the tight end position. The running back position for KU is probably the strong suit on their team. Absolutely. Devin Neal and Daniel Hyshaw. Um, Devin Neal, the Lawrence product, uh, one of only two on the two deep for Kansas that are right. actually from the state of Kansas. Um, from their official depth chart, by the way. It might, <laughs> might be different, the actual two deep. But Devin Neal, the Kansas product, um, very, very good at the running back position. So is Daniel Hyshaw. One thing K-State's good at defensively, though, is stopping the run. Yeah, they are. And we talked about our linebackers the last segment. We got to be good. And the thing about it is, though, teams have filled the gaps and the holes great against KU. But the missed tackles, they're both their running backs do a good job of running through first contact. They, they very rarely go down off of first contact. Mm-hmm. So we got to gang tackle. We got to run our feet. We can't arm tackle because if we do, it's going to be a long day. And like we talked about, we cannot give them momentum by any type any case, because if you get the momentum at home, Sunflower uh, Showdown, they're going to run with that and they try to keep it close. So our linebackers have to be good at tackling. One thing I've noticed about Kansas is throughout the years, they have continuously gotten better in the trenches. Yeah. I don't know if they're at the point now where that's necessarily um, an advantage over K-State. I think K-State's defensive line is significantly better than Kansas's offensive line. Mm-hmm. But that is still a point where they've gotten better. So it's not going to be easy for K-State just to dominate on the interior like they have, you know, throwing the defensive line as well. So that's going to be a matchup that I watch. Another matchup I watch is these receivers in Lawrence Arnold, Luke Grimm, Quentin Skinner against the D-backs for K-State. And mm-hmm. I don't think these receivers are nearly to the caliber that they've seen in Mizzou and Texas but they're good receivers. I think there's an added motivation, though, because last year Echo Boydo was from Lawrence and he played the cornerback position. We talked about him earlier. This year, Keenan Garber is also from Lawrence. He makes his, really, debut against Kansas yeah. in Lawrence. You throw in Jacob Parrish, who's also from the state of Kansas. Those are two or three cornerbacks that are from the state. Those guys, I, I have a really, really good feeling one of those guys is going to make a big play. I think both. I think they both will. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you 100%. They understand what's going on. They understand what's at stake. Not just bragging rights for another year, but a lot more. But those guys, I guarantee they're telling their teammates from the state of Texas, Florida, uh, Nebraska, Colorado, say, hey, guys, this is a pride thing for us. We do not lose the KU. We do not allow them to even come close. We're big brother for a reason. Uh, let's remind them. And I guarantee all week – They've been talking about it, and I know they'd be focusing. KU does have a good core of receivers, and not not because they're more athletic, but they run good routes, mm-hmm. and they're good at what they do. Um, I think Lawrence and Lawrence, KU will try to get the ball out fast. You talked about the O-line. Our D-line will put pressure, but I think they're going to put the quarterback in position to get the ball out fast, so we need to play tight coverage and not too loose to get them opportunities to get open. But I think our D-backs will be ready. And on the offensive side for K-State, obviously Will Howard is rolling. But one thing K-State, or excuse me, Kansas struggled with last week was stopping Taj Brooks. Texas Tech found a way to win that game late, actually through the air. Mm-hmm. Um, but Taj Brooks had over 100 yards in the first half. Now, he's obviously, I think, the best running back in the Big 12 at this point, arguably. Um, so he's a special back, but... K-State has some special backs, too. You look at this Kansas defense, Kenny Logan Jr., the veteran returns. He's their leading tackler. Mello Dotson has two pick sixes in the last three weeks. That's a guy to watch in the secondary. Um, But I look at this KU run defense, and if K-State's able to expose that, there's going to be some problems for the Jayhawks. Yeah, I think K-State, DJ Giddon, he has a big game. Uh, KU has struggled with big, physical, athletic backs in, in the past couple of weeks. And I think that, that trend will continue Saturday with DJ. And then you got Ward, who's a changeup. He's not very big, but he runs a lot harder than people realize mm-hmm. for a little guy. But here's the equal, here's the equalizer for K-State. And now he's the equalizer. Here, here's the key to K-State that's going to give KU fits. Ben Sennett. Mm-hmm. He's going to give him fits. They're going to put him at H-back. They're going to put him at tight end. I don't see anybody on KU's defense able to cover him one-on-one. So you either go zone or you got to double him. And when you do, he's going to expose somebody or somebody that's going to be open one-on-one. But I think Ben Sennett will have the game of his life. And you want to talk about that tight end position. Last year, Sammy Wheeler caught a touchdown against Kansas. There's going to be a lot of plays for the tight end. I do think Ben is going to have a good game. He is such a difference maker when he's open. It'll be interesting to see if Kansas tries to play zone or if they try to play man. You go back to that Baylor game, Baylor tried to play zone (laughs) on the goal line, and Ben Sinnott said, okay, I'm just going to go find a soft spot, and Howard found him for a touchdown. I think Will Howard's going to play a lot this game. Yeah. He's still he is the unquestioned starter. He's earned that right. He's played really well against Kansas in his career. You think back to that first half last year, he lit up that defense. I think we're going to see some Avery Johnson, and I know I've said that for weeks now. It seems like every week I say this is a perfect week to play Avery. Yeah. 
I do think they're going to see Avery Johnson. You talk about somebody who's motivated, another Kansas kid. Yep. There's going to be a plan for Avery Johnson to come in because they didn't really play Avery against Texas, mostly because I think the athleticism was – they were they were, they were were able to match the athleticism from K-State. Right. I don't think there's anybody on KU's defense that's as, le- as athletic as Avery. And, yeah, are we going to see some quarterback run for sure? That hasn't been a part of K-State's game the last few weeks because it, they haven't needed it. Yeah. But – I think they're going to use that quarterback run game this week. I, I think you're absolutely right for that for that reason, and then some. Um, you going back to the 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 uh, he been him been a Kansas kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like to call him the golden child with those mm-hmm. uh, those locks, but uh, he's special. And I think his time is now to to get opportunity to get some more in the playbook, uh, open it up a little bit, and why not a better game against KU? You know what I mean? You, your home, your home state. Why not? And it's an opportunity for him to get more reps moving into the rest of the season. But I think we will play a lot. But I think Avery will have a certain package as well mm-hmm. where they use him, and hopefully they're successful. I think we see two quarterbacks on the field. That's my bold take. I'm fine with that. I think we see some two quarterbacks <laughs> I'm fine with that. on the field. So as we wrap up the show, let's get into our picks and player to watch for this week. Monty, I will let you go first. Who is the guy to watch? I know you said Ben Sennett. And what's a score for Saturday? I'm sticking with Sennett just because he's been my guy all year. Um, I- I'm anxious for him to uh, finish what he started here at K-State, especially against KU. Uh, also, he was selected to go to the Senior mm-hmm. Bowl, so congrats to you on that. But I, whenever we play KU and whenever our offense is rolling and our defense is struggling, I can't help but think that we're going to score at least 45 points. So I'm going to go 45 to 21 cats. Yeah, see, I, I'm, I'm with you. I do think this is going to be a game where K-State scores a lot of points. It's just it's really hard to pick against K-State right now. Yeah. I mean, they've been so good to cover the spread. They've been so good on offense and good on defense. Take out the first half against Texas. And has this team been different on the road? They have. But this is not the same team. This is not the same Kansas team um, that they had with Jalen Daniels or even with Jason Bean if Cole Ballard plays. I think K-State is going to score a lot of points, and I think they're going to get some turnovers. My MVP for this game is going to be Jacob Parrish. This is going to be a guy who's going to get an interception. He might get two. I think Jacob picks off, um, especially if it's the the, the true freshman quarterback, he finds a way to get an interception for his team-leading fourth pick of the year. I'm going to say 42-21 Kansas State. I think this is going to be a game. It will be close. I I, I think that this will be closer than the final score indicates. I could see it being a one-score game at halftime, and then you know teams go back and forth, and maybe K-State scores a late touchdown up two scores. But um, I I do think they're going to score that 40-point mark, and they're going to keep Kansas below that 30-point mark. It's, It's going to be a great game to watch, and I'm very excited to watch it. I agree with you 100%. You know, it's one of those things where um, it's fun getting ready for a game like this because it's a rivalry game. The weather's going to be fairly decent at kickoff. But like you said, it will be tight because KU is a good team. They're number 25 for a reason. Mm -hmm. As much as I don't want to give them credit, they're a quality team and they're well coached. And their coach, uh, Coach uh, Lipo, he's done a phenomenal job of keeping those guys engaged and doing what they have to do. But I think when it's all said and done, K-State has more talent and we have more to play for and we're the better team. We will find out on Saturday, 6 o'clock on Fox Sports 1. If you are not planning on going to David Booth Memorial Stadium, Kansas State in Kansas. The, the Wildcats and the Jayhawks kick it off for the Sunflower Showdown. Wherever you are, enjoy the game, and we'll talk to you next Friday.